but this just felt a bit like, okay, like, like, why should I care? But I don't like the man. Don't like the man, don't care if he's running this amazing circus, whatever. But like, it literally tells you. And I'm like, that's what the whole conflict is. 50 pages from the end. Yes, I am superficial when it comes to books. Do a bit different. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all good. Today, we're gonna start a brand new channel. A brand new channel? That's too much work. I don't wanna like go nine to five job. I just wanna focus on like my inner peace and just like have a good mind. A brand new series on my channel called Judge a Cover. So I have always been so obsessed with book covers, book cover design. And so in this series, we're gonna see whether you can really judge a book by its cover. I've just been becoming increasingly interested in how book cover design works and what makes me pick up a book because I think I'm becoming increasingly superficial, materialistic and uh, being really into like book covers and special editions. And part of me wants to see like, does that actually have any bearing on how much I enjoy a book? And in this first episode, we're gonna start by reading my most beautiful books. These are the books that I, I think beautiful is a very specific thing. These are not just necessarily my favourite covers that I own, but these are the books that I think are like ornate or aesthetically gorgeous and beautiful. Not necessarily the coolest, the most original, most unique, but the most beautiful to me. This is all subjective, right? First, we have got, I absolutely love this cover, Fat Chance Charlie Vega by Crystal Maldonado. Now I feel like this doesn't really do it justice unless it's in person. It's got this gorgeous like, peachy design it's got this gold lettering and i think it's absolutely gorgeous and then the hardcover itself is like this lovely like pale pale pink off white i feel like this book looks just so gorgeous in person i just love it i think it's so gorgeous it's probably why i have prioritized picking this up over a lot of like other ya contemporaries that come out i don't read a lot of ya contemporaries and when i do i typically read the audiobook so that's probably why i have I prioritize this. So we're gonna see whether I enjoy this more than like other YA contemporaries. Then we've got another 2021 new release. 2021 had so many gorgeous books. Thank you. We have got Circus of Wonders by Elizabeth McNeil. Now tell me you're not obsessed with this cover. Like I love the embossing. I love the gold on here. I like how shiny it is. I love the circus design. I've all, I've shown this before. I love the end pages. And then I, oh my God, I'm going to cry. <laughs> I love the hardback itself with this dainty, dainty design. I think it is absolutely stunning. This is like one of my favorite books that I own. So we're going to see, do I actually love the inside as much? I've never read from this author before. I really don't know what to expect. And probably my favorite edition of a book I own, I want to collect this whole series. This is The Mystery of the Blue Train by Agatha Christie. Look at the blues and the oranges and the gold. Like... Cheese. <laughs> Beautiful. So this is like a special hardback edition that HarperCollins have done of like quite a few of Agatha Christie's books. This is one of them. And I'm reading the Erky Poirot books in order. So it just works out really well that this is the next book in the series. This is the sixth in the Erky Poirot series. Um, I know we've got a mystery on a train. I did love Murder on the Orient Express. That was the first one I read and then I've read them in order since. So I'm hoping that I will really enjoy this. I love a like isolated murder mystery, as many of you know, like an isolated closed circle murder mystery so I feel like that's what we're gonna get with this I'm really excited so what do we think what do we think what do we think do we think that I'm gonna love these books more because I love the covers or do we think it's gonna be like some three stars like I don't know I don't know what to expect but like I am so excited to read these books because of the covers I'm not gonna lie to you it's what makes me like really really want to pick them up i think i'm going to start with fat chance charlie vega i am on my way to london to go and meet emma and tasman for the first time i am so excited i can't believe we're finally going to meet in person and um i have brought fat chance charlie vega with me to read on the train I'm looking out from my window sounds coming up like the day before you're like a stone on my pillow I don't make a sound when I shut the door oh, You don't have to wake up yet Could you be the key? 
cutest cat in the world. Yes, you are. So I am halfway through Fat Chance Charlie Vega. Oh, firstly, hang on, haven't spoken about this. <laughs> It was so lovely to see Emma and Tasmin in the flesh. I still can't really believe it happened. I'm kind of in shock, but it was so lovely. And we had so much fun and it was just like the best time. But I am halfway through Fat Chance Charlie Vega and you guys, I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> yeah! I think it's already one of my favorite like straight up contemporaries. Like looking at my other contemporaries, a lot of them maybe are like told in verse or like have some kind of like other unusual element to them. But this is like your traditional YA contemporary romance. And it's one of my favorite of those. So in this we have Charlie Vega, who is fat. One thing I think this book does so well and this is something that I have struggled with myself. You know, I, I don't know whether body image on YouTube, I find a strange thing to talk about because I'm fine being fully open about like my body and like kind of what I think of myself or whatever, but I never want to like make anyone think something about themselves. And I think like social media is such a big, uh, comparison is a big problem. Like people, and I look so different in camera. Like I have makeup on half the time. Even when I don't, you look different on camera. I struggle knowing to talk about like, maybe my fitness journey that I'm on at the moment or stuff like that because I don't want to like upset anyone but anyway there's definitely parts of this book that I can relate to especially as well for my childhood basically when I was a kid I was a whole head taller than everyone else I was this height when I was about 10 I'm five six five seven when I was about 12 I remember I was wearing an adult size 18 so my weight uh, it's definitely something I struggled with in high school. I mean, I went to an all girls secondary school, so it wasn't that bad, but I can definitely relate to a lot of the feelings that this character is having. So one thing, getting back to my original point, just get to the point. One thing that I think this book does so well is examining the contrast that you can have as a fat person or you know, a person who doesn't fit into society's norms. Being fat positive for other people, but struggling to apply that narrative to yourself. Sometimes being proud of your body and like who you are, but like not all the time. And I think that's done that so well. And basically Charlie, she has his best friend and she is used to her best friend, like being the one that everyone loves. And she has this crush on this boy. This happens all fairly on, it's early on. It's not a spoiler, but he like asks Charlie to prom, but he only asks her to get her friend there. And then is upset when her friend doesn't turn up. And it's just really heartbreaking. But she's starting to have this kind of like a romance with this boy that she works with, Brian. Ryan, and it's a really sweet relationship. It hasn't really started yet. I think it's gonna be quite slow build. And I feel like the characters are acting like teenagers, like they're swearing. I hate in YA when like you can tell the author wanted to swear, but they were scared. <laughs> and I'm like, girl, come on, just give me the F word a couple of times. But I love the discussions that are happening around the complexity of being fat. I would say maybe if you struggle, it's hard because I think people, who want fat rep should read this, but also I can see elements of it that may be triggering. Like uh, her mum is always trying to push weight loss shakes onto her and they have a very fractured relationship or, you know, when it comes to like shopping for clothes and just bought self body image. I think like make that judgment call yourself over whether you think it may trigger you or whether you think it could be a really helpful thing to read, but it's such an easy read. I'm absolutely flying through it. And that's my favorite type of contemporary when you have the joyous moments and the romancy moments with also a journey that the character is going on in their attitudes towards themselves or something in their life. That's my favorite combo. Really, really loving it. Okay, so it's very late at night, so apologies if I look a bit crusty. <laughs> I loved it, you guys. I loved it. It almost made me cry. No, in fact, it did make me cry. You know when you get, like, tears in your eyes and they congregate and they spill over the lash on a bit and you get wetness here? Not a tear roll, but, like, throat hurting, kind of, like, 
crying. You know what I mean? I don't know why, because I very rarely get like attached to romances, but maybe in some ways I could relate to the character and like what she was feeling. The conflict in this made me cry. It made me cry. And like, I, if you told me that, I would have said, no, that's not happening. But it did. I was like, oh my God. That shit took me, caught me off guard. I did not expect it. And this was just so much fun. Their relationship, the romance in this, I got so into it. I loved all of the characters in it. I loved like the co the complex relationship she has with her mum, the friendship that she has. I thought it was just such a well-written YA. And I think I would have loved to read this when I was like 16. It took me back to when I was 16. I was in my first relationship. Well, I've only ever been in one relationship, but I was in my first relationship. <laughs> and just that feeling of like being 16 and being in love. Cause she's 16 turning 17 in this. And I was 16 turning 17 in my, when, I, when we started going out. So like, it took me back to how that feels to be that age and to like be in love. Maybe like be emotional. <laughs> The journey that Charlie Vega goes on throughout this book is just impeccable. The fact that it's a debut, we love to see it. Now, one thing I would say, if you wanna read this, don't look up the synopsis. Don't look up the synopsis. I have never seen such a bad case of this. Legit, I, I actually can't, I actually can't. Something that's in the synopsis, doesn't happen until 50 pages from the end. It tells you the big conflict causer in the synopsis. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Why would anyone do that? Why do you think that's a good idea? That we don't do that in this household. You don't do that. Surely someone who writes synopses would know you don't do that. I can see you're getting angry. Angry? No, I'm not angry. I'm livid. There's no hints towards it or there's very few hints towards it and I only picked them up because I knew what was coming. But like it literally tells you and I'm like, that's what the whole conflict is. 50 pages from the end. Like why? 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 It doesn't make any sense to me. So I just think go into it blind because I don't think you should know that. That shouldn't be in the synopsis. That angers me. It angers me. I was very angry. I was very angry. I was angry. I was angry. Obviously other than that, it was a success. So this gives a point towards beautiful covers, beautiful insides. So I'm gonna read Snackers of Wonders now. I'm so excited to read this. Oh, oh my, my god. <laughs> I'm so excited. I really hope I'm gonna love it. Victorian circus. <gasps> it's everything I've ever wanted. Can we just talk about how gorgeous it is even without the dust jacket. Like I am, I just keep looking at this and I'm obsessed. Like the daintiness of these lines. Oh my God, it makes me wanna cry. I am about a hundred pages in to Circus of Wonders and I am enjoying it. Not much has happened yet. It's been a bit of a slow start. So Nell has been born. I think it's like birthmarks. By the way, if I sound locked up, I have had like an attack of hay fever today and like I am struggling to breathe. <laughs> Like, talking is hard. <laughs> yeah, Nell's born with, like, birthmarks on her body. So the circus people have kind of been referring to her as Leopard Girl, which is obviously, like, a fence. Like, you wouldn't call someone that today. And her father, when he was drunk, sells her to the circus. And she's going to be, like, dressed up to be, like, an icon in the circus, basically. And we are following three perspectives so far. We follow Nell's perspective. We follow Jasper, who is the owner of the circus. And we follow Toby, his brother. I really like Toby and Nell. I don't like Jasper. But I don't think Jasper is there to be liked. <laughs> These white men are dangerous. My guess is that over the course of the novel, he's gonna like abuse his power and he does so already maybe, as kind of suggested. I'm not like 100% sure, but I don't like the man. Don't like the man. Don't care if he's running this amazing circus, whatever. Toby is very soft and caring and he obviously cares for Nell. So I'm really enjoying like their dynamic and Nell is a really like headstrong, interesting character, but it's very slow. I am enjoying the way it's told though. I can't put my finger on it, but I feel like you'll all understand what I'm talking about. Books written for this particular audience, like historical, I don't know whether it's literary fiction, not really, but like adult, historical fiction that always is like big up in Waterstones. Like think The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna. Do you know what I mean? 
Do you know the kind of books I mean? No! It's in your brain! It's in your head! But they're all told in this way that like feels like I'm only supposed to read these kind of books if I want to read this book. Does that make any kind of sense or do I sound crazy? I feel like you know what I'm talking about. I feel like we're on the same wavelength, even if I am chatting shit. <laughs> So I was hoping the writing would be a bit more whimsical, a bit more like magical, but it's, it's not really. But nothing has really happened yet. <laughs> I'm enjoying the start of it, but like nothing has really happened. Nothing's really happened. Nothing has really happened. I'm gonna go read some more. Hopefully when I see you in the morning, I will, uh, I'll be able to breathe. <laughs> and yeah, I don't know. I'm enjoying it, but it's not like everything I want it to be yet, but it, it like, Nothing has gone bad, nothing has annoyed me, that means it can't become that. That means it can't become what I want it to be. each other oh we are oh we love each other so much oh this <sighs> she's the part of it i have just read like another 130 pages ish of circus of wonders and i'm enjoying it but like i don't know here's the thing it's a very pleasant read I'm enjoying the reading experience. I'm having fun reading it. I feel very absorbed in the world, but like, I don't think I'm gonna give this like five stars. Like, I don't think I'm that girl. I don't think I'm necessarily the girl that this book is written for, and that's okay. I feel like the atmosphere of the circus is really well created. I love a lot of like the characters we've got the circus. One thing I think this does super well is showing the truth of like these, you know, circus owners at the time, like curiosities, circuses, like ba P.T. Barnum, um, which if you don't know, the movie The Greatest Showman is about him. And like, it's talking about all the awful shit he did. And I feel like that's why this book was written. I feel like this book is a response to the success of The Greatest Showman. Cause it kind of, it makes sense timeline wise that the idea would have been spurred by that. Because obviously that film paints him as like, <laughs> like just like this lovely guy. We all love Hugh Jackman. I mean like, he's like the person we love the most. Is that true? It's very true. But that guy was actually a shit in real life. He was not good. <laughs> he like preyed, you know, on these people who society cast out and made a lot of money off of them. So I feel like this this book is doing a really good job of showing the truth of these men and how cutthroat and like cynical and like abusive of their power they were. So that is probably one of my favorite aspects of it. Although I hate the character Jasper, I just find him incredibly annoying. I'm much more interested in Toby and Nell and their relationship and their storylines. I think Toby might be my favorite. He's like this soft, gentle giant. Both him and Jasper, their brothers, I think I mentioned that. They served in the Crimean War together. Toby was a photographer, actually. He wasn't a soldier, he was a photographer there. And he's obviously got like some dark secret that keeps being hinted at, but uh, he's very like affected and scarred and suffering from PTSD from the war, which I don't think was very well like understood back then. And like, he's just so soft and he's got this storyline. I don't want to spoil it obviously, cause it's a spoiler. Oh, okay, move away from me then. Oh no, he's just trying to get closer to her. Can you see how obsessed he is with her? He's her son. Yeah, he's got this storyline, which I'm not gonna spoil, but it's like making my heart break a little. Like this something, he's gone off and done something. And it's just like heartbreaking. I love the like Victorian setting. I listen, we all know I'm a hoe for Victoriana, like forever and always a hoe for Victoriana. So yeah, I'm enjoying it, but it's not like a new favorite. But I would recommend it so far, especially if you like Victorian settings like me. But it's not boring, but do you know what I mean when these books are always written a bit like, oh, I'm clever. Like, I'm a great book. You know what I mean? It's like, it's just, this book is saying to me, I'm a great book. Do you know what I mean? Does anyone know what I mean? Anyway, uh, I'm gonna go finish it. I'm just hoping it goes somewhere like a bit unpredictable in this last 120 pages. So I finished Circus of Wonders last night and I think I'm gonna give it like a 3.5. So I am a bit disappointed because this was like my favorite cover, like in the world, my favorite cover. It's sad, it's sad. 
you know it's it's a shame the ending of this for me just didn't 100% hit the mark i just yeah it just i was just a bit bored i was just a bit bored it didn't quite give me like of, I don't know I don't know and the writing never fully got me I will say I think this book did such a good job of like trying to give a voice to the performers of this day in these circuses who were so mistreated had so little agency how they were just seen as a means to an end a means of a profit I thought it did such a good job of that and of like I guess dispelling some of the romanticism of these of these circuses that has been dreamt up by films such as The Greatest Showman so I think it did a, such a great job of that. It's obviously such a well-researched book and I would recommend it just for that, like just for like the history aspect of it. But in terms of like how much I loved it, it I just feel like it's going to be a book I forget. You know, I think at the end of the year, when I'm looking back on the books I've read, this will be a really forgettable book. Like I don't think I'll think about it that much. But I just felt like it was always just a step more removed from me than I wanted it to be. I always struggled a little bit to like visualize some things. I would say there's a relationship in this between Nell and um, like a young girl that like comes and joins the circus. And that was one of my favorite aspects of it as well. Um, like the love that she, she feels for that child and how protective she is of her. So yeah, I don't know. I just feel like it's a bit forgettable and I don't, I didn't have like very strong feelings upon finishing it. The epilogue was heartbreaking. I did have strong feelings upon finishing that, but just like on the book as a whole, it just felt like a step removed from where I wanted it to be. Now I have actually <laughs> already read half of The Mystery of the Blue Train. I'm gonna be honest, the whole time I was reading this, I was kind of looking forward to reading this. And boy, did I cheat like a mug. It's been about like nine months, I think, since I've read Agatha Christie, and I just really enjoy them. They're like short, they're quick reads, and I just, you know me, I love a murder mystery. I love a murder mystery, what can I say? I think we all need to be reading more murder mysteries. I've spoken about this in another video the other day, but this is basically the book that was, the next book that Agatha really wrote after she went missing and her husband had cheated on her and she kind of had a breakdown because her husband was cheating on her. And this book is about this woman whose husband is cheating on her. Is it a coincidence? Is it a coincidence? I ask you, is it a coincidence? And she gets murdered on this train. And like, I feel like, girl, this is a bit of a self insert. Like, I really hope you're okay. I hope you're fine. And like, because I know stuff about the story, basically Agatha's mum really warned her off from mar marrying the guy that she married. And in this, the girl's dad is like, I told you not to marry him. And there's just so many things. I'm like, girl, I, I hope you're okay. I mean, I know she's dead and this was like, you know, a hundred, was it a hundred years ago? When did this even come out? I could not tell you. This was a long time ago, but I'm just like, girl, I hope you're okay. <laughs> I hope you're good. <laughs> we spent the first 60 pages meeting a lot of our different players in the story. The girl, her dad, her husband, this other woman who's a bit mysterious. And then they got on the train and then the murder happened and then everyone's off the train. So it's not like Murder on the Orient Express where if you don't know, they're kind of like, they all they are trapped on the train. We don't really have that like claustrophobic atmosphere of the train that I was like expecting. Like you're trapped, you're isolated with these, with the murderer. Like it's not that everyone's just gone off and is doing their own thing in the French Riviera, like poodling about being rich. I feel like this book, you want it to be the cheating husband because he was on the train too <gasps> with his mistress. <gasps> But I think it's a bit too obvious. I don't think it's going to be him. But yeah, it's it's strange because it's not what I was expecting in terms of how the storyline is playing out. I'm intrigued as to why this is one of the books that has got this special edition. Like one of these, because there's not been many of them in this special edition. And I guess maybe this is one of her most popular ones. But I'm intrigued like why something, I feel like The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, which is fifth in this series, is such a notorious book um, for how great it is. And it, that was a really good one. That's probably my favourite. That's my favourite Hercule Poirot one I've read so far, other than Murder on the Orient Express. But in terms of like the ones I've read throughout this series chronologically, that is my favourite one. And that hasn't got one of these editions, so I'm intrigued as to why this has been chosen. I feel like it has to be great. I'm hoping for like really good things. I want something shocking, and I also want Agatha to like bunk off the cheating husband somehow, because it's what she deserves. It's what she deserves. It's what she deserves.
guys. Ah! <laughs> I just finished it. Didn't take me long. Like this took me maybe like three, three to four hours to read somewhere in that bracket. I am going to give it three stars. I'm going to give it three stars. My success rate with Agatha Christie is not good, but I think I'm just very picky with her because I know what she can do. So my problem with this is that it felt a bit dispassionate. For me, Agatha Christie at her best is when there is a twist to the whole concept of the murder. Not just me not being able to predict who the killer was, it being something that I could never have predicted about like the reasoning or the context behind the murder, if that makes sense, like what, how the murder actually occurred. That's when I rated her highest. I think she does that so well when she does it, but this just felt a bit like, okay, like, like why should I care? Clap if you care. Clap if you, clap if you care. I could read that in like a thousand other books and I come to Miss Agatha for something a bit different. different. Here's the thing, it's like wonderfully crafted, especially for its time. Like I could never have predicted this was what was gonna have happened. But at the same time, I just wanted something more. I want something different because I know she can do it. And I'm like, why did this get the special edition? when the murder of Roger Ackroyd is right there. Cause now I have one of the most beautiful books I own and I didn't love the inside of it. But I'm never too sad if I'm disappointed in Agatha Christie cause there's so many more out there. I recognize that some of her books, cause of the context of the time, I feel like some of them are kind of like filler books. Do you know what I mean? And then she has like the heavy hitters. There's something that is comforting and cozy about reading Agatha Christie book, even if you don't love it. Like I still enjoyed the experience of sitting here today and like reading this whole book in barely any time at all. So in this video, we started off very successfully. We had probably one of my favorite like YA contemporary, YA contemporary romances of all time with Fat Chance Charlie Vega. Then we slipped down a little bit with Circus of Wonders and then we slipped down a bit with Mission of the Blue Train. I was so confident after I read this. I was like, this video, this video, I, I'm about to prove beautiful covers equals beautiful insides. But I have kind of done the opposite. I didn't like dislike any of these books, but these two were definitely a bit disappointing when going into this, all of these were like 4.5 five star predictions for me because they're so beautiful. I would still recommend this. I think it was still a lot of fun. I think I wouldn't recommend this unless you like want to read the Erky Poirot books in order like I am. I think, you know, Murder of Jack Croyd, Murder on the Express, like kind of like her bigger name ones are where I'm seeing her success so far. So this wasn't successful in proving beautiful books equals beautiful insides. But I hope you've enjoyed this vlog. I'm very happy with the books that I've read. These were ones I really wanted to read. So I'm really glad to finally get them off my list. Let me know what some of the most beautiful covers you own are that maybe you want to read or you have read. And if you've got to the end of the video, comment a heart eyes emoji. Comment a heart eyes emoji because we love, we love love. <laughs> And yeah, I hope you're looking forward to the rest of this series. Obviously covers, there's endless things we can talk about. So there's endless uh, videos I have got planned for this series that we're gonna do over time. And we're gonna see, can you ever judge a book by its cover? This first episode said no, but we're gonna test out some different things. So we'll see as time goes on. And yeah, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you all so, so much. And I'll see you very soon in another video. Bye.